My name is Mark. Delighted to be with you today. Thank you for this amazing opportunity. Um, it's the first time I've ever been with this group. And as the Lord allows, hopefully it won't be the last. I'm here because I'm very good friends with Bob Payne. And I'm good friends with Bob Payne because uh, when I was in my 20s, I went to work for the Southern Baptist Home Mission Board. And a few weeks after I went to work there, a man named Henry Blackaby came and started working there. And he moved into my cul-de-sac. <laughs> and my life changed forever. And I have been so blessed to have Henry in my life for all these years. And then Richard now, as he and I get to travel around and speak together. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to draw your attention to God's Word. So I pray you'll take your scripture and let's turn to the book of Matthew together. Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel is a wonderful gospel. It highlights, among other things, the kingship of Jesus. <laughs> that whole first chapter of Matthew is all the lineage because a king has a lineage. And it's in Matthew's gospel that we see John come and, and he's the one who prepares the way. Because when a king arrives, he doesn't just show up without any notice. There's a crier who says, get ready, get prepared. The king is about to come. And then in Matthew's gospel, it's where the, the wise men from the east come and they bear gifts. What? Fit for a king. And it's in Matthew's gospel that Jesus describes his kingdom in that amazing Sermon on the Mount. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. But some have said after he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, it is a kingdom rejected. And here he takes his disciples as we're going to look in chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel and he sends them out and that's where I want to draw your focus this morning in Matthew's gospel chapter 10 verse 16 behold I send you out as sheep among wolves so be shrewd as serpents and then innocent as doves. God bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. Oh God, author and finisher of our faith, God, the author of all that is good, we come to you on this another day. Grateful for your gospel that is being proclaimed around the globe, even at this hour. Father, we are all in desperate need of you. As we wake today, as we leave today, we step out into a wicked world. And truth be known, all of us carry with us in us a heart that is prone to rebellion. God, we know that without you, we can do nothing. Oh, Lord, hold us safe today. Remove from our heart the love of every idol of every kind. God, may we engage in nothing which can't implore your best blessing and in invite your inspection. Lord, I pray you'll teach us today how to redeem our time, how to improve our talents, how to walk in wisdom toward those without and in kindness toward those within, how to do good to all people, especially, Lord, those who oppose us. Oh, blessed Lord, let us climb up near you right now. Wrap your, your loving arms around us. Keep us ever desiring you. Keep us always humble regarding your will. Lord, we pray that the lost will be converted. Lord, we pray for our cities, these wicked, sinful cities. We pray for these small towns and villages where hope has been lost. Lord, we pray sinners will be converted. Now, Lord, breathe upon this congregation. And breathe upon me, your servant. For if you don't speak through me, I have nothing to say. So I plead with you, God. Please. Speak through this, your broken vessel of clay. For your glory, for the edification of these people, to the glory of God, in the precious and powerful name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Those who were listening to Jesus knew what it was like to have sheep among wolves. I grew up in a rural area. I passed through a rural church in a town of 400 people, about 40 or 50 people on Sunday morning. The good news is that three years ago, there were three people there on Sunday morning. <laughs> the church was ready to close its doors. And my wife and I found out about it, and so we drove over there and prayed with them. And I said, look, I have a full-time job, but this little town needs a church, and if you'll call me as your pastor at no pay, I'll come. They said, well, we got to think about that. <laughs> a little bit like Jack Benny, you know, the guy put a gun to his back and said, your money or your life. And he didn't say anything. The guy said, your money or your life. He said, I'm thinking it over. So I think in some ways they were thinking it over. Do we die or call this guy? And uh, finally, after two weeks, the vote was two yes and one abstention. And so I went. But we've been there now for three years, and to God's glory, we've seen 20 people baptized, and 40 or 50 folks there every Sunday morning. There are little towns like that all across North America, and I pray for those towns. And there are struggling churches, dying churches all across North America. There's nothing about a dying church that glorifies God, and I pray we see all of them come back. But I say all that to say I grew up in a rural area, and if you grew up in a rural area, you're used to seeing some rather violent things among livestock and what can happen and certainly in Jesus day when wolves got among sheep it was not pretty it was brutal it was something you turned away from the wolves were not kind they were not gentle with their prey it would have been a bloody gory mess and so when Jesus says I'm going to send you out into this world that is the picture he painted for them and I think sometimes we are fully unprepared for what we're going to encounter in a world that is dominated by sin and Satan and opposes us. But we cannot avoid this world. We cannot cloister ourselves away and ignore this world. We are called to be sheep among those wolves. And so today I just want to ask, how do we live rightly in a broken world? The world is broken. It's, it's, it's becoming more broken and more corrupt every day. We often look at it. We can't believe it's worse today than it was yesterday. I'm often reminded of, reminded of the, the little nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> you know, he sat on a wall. And you know, he had a great fall. I had a picture book when I was a kid, and my mom and dad would read that to me, and they would show me the picture. I don't know why Humpty was always dressed like in a bow tie and pants, but he was. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was doing on that wall to begin with. But Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And then this line. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Doesn't matter how hard the secular world, the political world, the government world, no matter how good their intentions, no matter how much they try, all the power of the world, all the king's horses, all the king's men can't put this world back together again. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the message only those who've been redeemed have. And so we don't have the opportunity or the privilege or the prerogative to not go and share the truth that can actually heal lives and heal brokenness. We have that truth. So Jesus sends us out as sheep among wolves. But there's much to fear. If you have your Bible still open, we're going to drop down and look at verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he become like his teacher and a slave like his master. Listen, this is what Jesus says. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, the devil, how much more will they malign members of his household? Jesus says, look, they called me Satan. They're not going to treat you any better. 
I know years ago, standing here in this beautiful pulpit, in this beautiful chapel, obviously thinking so much of, of Billy Graham. Remember as a younger man watching him, especially when he would be on Larry King, and Larry would try to or just corner him in some way with a question, and no one could answer a question better than Dr. Graham. But I remember in those days thinking, many Christians are far more concerned about how they come across to Larry King than they are about how they come across to the King of Kings. And we're never going to be loved by this world. We're never going to be embraced by this world. We're never going to be applauded by this world. Jesus makes it clear if we're truly his disciples, the world did not love him. The world called him Satan. And we really shouldn't expect any treatment better. Aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> Obviously, it stands in stark contrast to what you hear many times on television and radio and on the media, where basically Jesus just wants you to be happy. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to have everything in this world. That's a lie from hell. The happiest place you can be is in poverty if you're in the arms of Jesus. The greatest place you can be is perhaps with a critical, even terminal <laughs> disease if you feel the love of Christ all around you. That's another sermon for another day. But look what he says in verse 26. We're going to look at about three fears. Therefore, he says, do not fear those. Verse 26, rather. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Verse 27, I tell you, what is in the darkness, speak in the light, and whatever you hear whisper in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. Let me, let me tell you what he says. This is so encouraging to us today. What he's saying is, what you see today is not what's always going to be there. I used to pastor, my first church I pastored was a little country church in rural North Missouri. I was 18 years old. That was too young to pastor, all right? But they were gracious. And the little country church had, had a cemetery out in the front, actually. And, of course, it wasn't air-conditioned in those days. And, and so I would stand to preach, and, and the back doors would be open, and I would look at a... A graveyard in front of me and a cemetery out the door, if you know what I'm saying. But no, <laughs> it was an older church, all right? But I would, I would, I would often, and it was an older church. We had, we had a, I'll never forget, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, had a, we had a velvet painting of the Lord's Supper behind me back there. Looked like you could have bought it at a truck stop. And, uh, <laughs> I, um, first couple of weeks I was there, I took that thing down. And uh, nearly got fired and put it back up. So that's the way that goes. But I, I used to look out the back of that. And here's what I knew even then. Listen, I knew even then. If while I was preaching that Sunday morning. By the way, out in a rural cemetery. you got to Listen, if you're buried in a rural cemetery, God love you. You know what? They bury your face in the east. Amen. So when the eastern sky opens, you don't have to turn around and look this way. That's true. That's absolutely true. In the city, they'll just put you whichever direction fits. But in the rural area, you're going to be facing the eastern sky. I'm going to be buried in a rural cemetery up where my grandparents and great parents are. We were up there on Memorial Day. And I told my wife, I said, honey, this is where we're going to end up, right here. I said, come on, lay down by me. Let's see what this is. <laughs> I said, you're nuts. I'm not laying down there. I said, what are you going to put on my headstone? She said, I'm going to put you, you can lay there as long as you don't snore. That's what I'm <laughs> but as I was looking out the back of that church building, I knew that if the eastern sky opened at that moment and the Lord returned, that that cemetery would empty up of all those who were dead in Christ. Amen. And then you know what else would happen? That dysfunctional rural church that liked weird things and a picture of velvet Jesus behind me, that dysfunctional rural church would immediately be transformed in a to a perfected body of Christ as they were lifted up into the air. Because this mortal will put on immortality, this corruptible will put on incorruption, and what we see now is not what's going to always be. And let me tell you what happened one time. One time it looked really bad. 
Those disciples didn't want to go to Jerusalem. It's the last place they wanted to go. Thomas said, if he goes and dies, let's go with him. And sure enough, when they got to Jerusalem, it went from bad to worse. So bad that they saw one of their most trusted Judas sell Jesus for nothing more than 30 pieces of silver. And then they saw Jesus beaten beyond recognition. And then they scattered into the darkness. And even Simon Peter, who stayed close by, couldn't bring himself to fulfill his commitment he made just hours before. Anybody ever identify with that kind of failure in your life? He cursed and he swore. He said he didn't know Jesus. And they took Jesus and they, they put that crown of thorns on him and they beat him beyond recognition. And as a common criminal, he is carrying a cross. He, he falls under the weight of it and, and Simon helps him and they get to, the, get to the top of Calvary. And there, Roman soldiers nail his body to that cross. And then they lift it up and people mock him and spit upon him. And the soldiers gamble for his garments. Then they ran a spear into his side. And for everything the world could look at, he was nothing more than a phony, than a failure, than a dead Jew. And they took that dead body off of that cross among all the other criminals. And they wrapped up that dead body in grave clothes and they laid it in a borrowed tomb. And they put a stone in front of it and they put a Roman seal on that stone and they put two guards by it and that was that. And folks, sometimes we look around at the world and we say, what in the world? Where is the power of Christ? Where is God? It's just dominated by sin. It just keeps getting worse and worse. But let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened on that Sunday morning. In that dead body, in that tomb, Blood began to flow in those veins again. That heart began to pump again. Those lungs began to fill with air again. Those eyes opened again. And God miraculously blew open that tomb. And Jesus came out victorious forever over sin, death, and the grave. What is now will not always be. So Jesus says, don't be afraid about what you see now. Because one day everything's going to be known. And listen to me. One day. Every person who is, every person who hates Christ, who hates the church, who hates the truth, who speaks violently against it, every person, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some, out of complete admiration and glory, and some out of total fear, but it'll be too late. Don't be afraid as you go out among sheep, among wolves. What it is now is not what it's always going to be. And qu quickly, I serve Southern Baptists leading their church revitalization ministries and I work in dying churches all the time and I know what a struggle they are, but I do know this. As I said, at that moment of Christ's return, every dying church, every dysfunctional church is going to be the perfected body of Christ. Many, many years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. for a meeting, and I, I wanted to go take some pictures of the Capitol. It was covered in scaffolding, so it looked, it didn't, you know, you, what, you what, scaffolding? You can take pictures of that? It just, and canvas all around it, so whatever. So I went back a few years later and it was, scaffolding was gone. It was nighttime and the picture was gorgeous. I just think sometimes we see little churches here, little churches there. Y'all, look, you're not going to find a perfect church. If you do, don't join it because then it won't be perfect anymore. So you're not going to find a perfect church. They're all got problems. Listen, I got, I got news for you. The church in Ephesus had problems. And if you had John as your pastor and you got problems, every church is going to have problems. Now, so it had problems, all right? But I'll tell you what. So you look around and you go, man, the church doesn't look real beautiful. It's not really gorgeous. But when Jesus comes again, the scaffolding falls off. And the church is going to be glorified. It's going to be beautiful. And those people you worship with on Sunday morning that sometimes rub you the wrong way and you can't agree with, man, one day they're going to be perfect. You're going to be perfect. It's all going to be perfect. What is not seen now will one day be seen. Verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body. They are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Don't be afraid. When you go, don't, don't worry about what, what, how it looks. The odds are against us. Things, things aren't always going to be that way. Secondly, you cannot go around fearing death. 
If there's anything the church in North America and around the world needed to proclaim in 2020 is we do not fear death. We don't run around scared of it. We don't embrace it. But for us, you know what death is? Death is the vestibule to heaven. The tomb is not the end. The tomb is the entrance. We don't run from the tomb. We embrace the tomb. My goodness, the world looks at Christians and, you know, the one thing the world is terrified of and yet in love with is death. Yeah. Want to kill babies in the womb. Want to kill old people. But we're scared to death of death and everything's going to kill you. Coffee, tea, everything you like is going to kill you. <laughs> Every time you turn on the news, something else is going to kill you. I got news. We're all going to die. <laughs> Don't be afraid of death. They can't kill you. And you see that in the first century. You see one of the, listen, God used the martyrdom of those first century Christians to be a testimony that the world could not ignore. How can you ignore people who are not afraid of death? I don't have that. But when, Christ, when non-Christians look at you and you and I, look, we don't want to leave our loved ones. Well, death is sad. Jesus cried in the tomb of Lazarus. We were supposed to weep when those leave us. We're going to miss them. Death is an enemy. It is, a, it is something that brings great heartache. But, you know, we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We mourn as those who have hope. Jesus says, don't fear death. Because if you go around fearing death, you're going to live in total fear all the time. Because death is always around the corner. And I know what I'm talking about. Some of us live with anxiety. It's a constant constant in our lives. Anxiety and depression. I struggle with that in my own life. And when you do that, thoughts of death and disease are just with you all the time. Not only you, but your loved ones. And you have to remind yourself that in our body there are no rogue cells. Every cell is under the control of Almighty God and His sovereign hand. I have nothing to fear. Jesus says, don't fear those who can kill you. But he adds a little warning here. <laughs> but rather, you do need to fear those who could destroy the soul. Your real fear, humanity's fear is not death. Humanity's fear is God's judgment in hell. That is what, wouldn't it be awesome if the world was as terrified of that as they are every disease that comes along? If they understood what they were really up against. You know, people say that when you're in hell, you're absent from God forever. Would that be true? That would be better. You're not absent from God. You're an object of the holy God's wrath for all eternity. And Jesus speaks more about hell than anybody in the Bible. And you would wish that the secular world would fear hell far more than they fear death. You don't need to fear what you see in the world because that's not what's always going to be. As a believer, we do not fear death. It has been defeated. We don't fear hell because it's been defeated as well. Verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them fall to the ground apart from your father. But the hairs of your head are numbered. So do not fear. You're more valuable than sparrows. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you, a bird doesn't chirp in the North Carolina woods that God doesn't hear it. Can I, you know, I, 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 we had children growing up, you know, and, and they would, we'd have, a couple, we had a couple of boys, and, and, and uh, I've got some friends who had some girls, and I'm, I'm, I love them all, but grateful we had boys. I think they were a lot easier to deal with. Just, I had sisters, that's all I had. And I'll take the boys. Anyway, we had a couple of boys, and, and you know, we'd have a van, and, and they'd have their friends within the van, and my wife and I'd be driving and they'd be talking to us all at one time. We want to go here. We want to go there. We want. And how many times have you said, all right, I can't listen to all of you at once. Or as my parents were getting up in age before they went to be with Jesus, they knew the one could hear. But that didn't stop them from talking at the same time. <laughs> so my wife and I would be at my parents' house and my dad would be over here and my mother would be over here. And they would both be carrying on simultaneous conversations with us at once. That had nothing to do with either one of them. And eventually I would have to say, whoa, whoa, mom, dad, I can't listen to what? Both of you at once. Can I tell you something glorious about God? 
And there could be billions and billions of people on the earth who know Jesus and speak to him. And he hears everyone as though you're the only one talking. Wow. He knows when a bird falls from its nest. And if he knows when a bird falls from its nest, how much more valuable are you? Who are you in the sight of God? Oh, listen, we've already heard this text once, but man, you can't hear it often enough. I'll tell you who you are. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ in every way, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. (laughs) Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons, Through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise, to the glorious grace which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness and trespasses of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fulfillment of time, united in all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance and have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be there to praise his glory in him you also when you heard the truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him and were sealed with the promise of his Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire and possess it to the praise of his glory Yeah, you're a little more important than a sparrow. (laughs) Read that every day if you need to. And you wonder, who am I in the eyes of God? God says, don't worry about anything. God doesn't miss a thing. You know, when when Jesus appears to John in the book of Revelation chapter 1, John says he had eyes of fire. You know what that really means? Eyes of fire, eyes that don't miss anything. He sees it all. God knows every problem, every pain, every anxiety, every concern you have. You are never alone. Oh, you, you are so valuable to Him. And, and let, me, let, me, let me try to quickly just to compose, just suppose this. You're valuable to Him not because He needs you. God does not need you to complete Him. He would be fine if you were never created. But for His glory, He wants you to enjoy Him. So he makes himself available to you in all of his glory. And for his own glory and because of his graciousness, he invites you to love him and be with him for all eternity. You're that valuable. You're his child. You remember when the the prodigal ran away and when he came back, the scripture says the father saw him when he was still a long way off. I used to think that that meant the father was like at the farmhouse, you know, and he saw him down the dirt road. But that's not... I just know what that means. He, he saw him. They knew he was coming. And, and, and that young man would have had to walk through the town with the shame of all the townspeople saying, See, look, he ruined everything. We knew he would. But the father didn't want him to walk that way alone. So the father went out there and put his arm around him and walked with him through the town. And this is my son and I am not ashamed of him. And then when they got to the house, the father said, Bring out the best robe. Who had the best robe in the house? The father. Put my righteousness on him. You are loved by God. Not because of anything you've done, just because of who he is. No, don't fear what the world looks like. It won't always be that way. Don't fear death. It has been defeated. Don't worry that you don't matter to him. You matter more than you ever could possibly imagine. Verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men... I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But who who denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. It ends with this. We don't have to have any fear because we will be acknowledged before God in front of Jesus as we remain faithful. That's what we work for. 
You know, we all say, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, let me tell you something. In order to hear it, you got to do well, good and faithful servant. <laughs> all right? And how you do well? You go out as cheap among wolves. You go out in a broken, fallen, sinful world. You go out loving that world and caring for that world with great compassion, even when that world doesn't love you. And you go out realizing, I can be positive because what I'm seeing now is not what's always going to be there. I can be positive because even death cannot hurt me. I can be positive because no matter how little I have in this world or how marginal I may feel, I am loved by Him in a way I could never imagine. I can get up every day and I can have joy because of those truths alone. And I can know that if I am faithful and I confess Him before this wicked and sinful world, there will come a time when He will confess me before His Father in heaven. I get through these hours of anxiety and discouragement and depression and problems with family and worries about disease and all of those things by knowing there will come a day when I'm going to stand in His presence. And He's going to say, well, let me just read what Spurgeon says. <laughs> Gracious promise. It's a great joy to confess my Lord. Whatever my faults may be, I am not ashamed of Jesus, nor do I fear to declare the doctrines of the cross. Sweet is the prospect that this text sets before me. Friends, they may forsake me. Enemies, they will attack me. But the Lord never disowns His servant. Doubtless my Lord will own me here in this life and give me abundant tokens of His favor in this life. But there will come a day when I must stand before the great Father and what bliss to think that Jesus will confess me then. He will say, This man truly trusted me and was willing to be reproached for my name's sake and therefore... I acknowledge him as mine. The other day, a great man was made a knight. He knelt before the sovereign king who handed him a jeweled necklace. But what of that? It'll be an honor above all honors for the Lord Jesus to confess me as one of his in the divine presence of all the majesties of heaven. Never let me be ashamed of the Lord. Never let me indulge in a cowardly silence. Never let me indulge in a faint-hearted compromise. Shall I ever blush to own Him who has promised to own me? God, our Father, plant your word in our hearts for your glory and our edification. In Jesus' name.